Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is Gateway Project number 15. And right here, this is Minmus, and we have a very large space station to send to Minmus because we need to start analyzing the anomaly from the last episode where we sent the rover, and the rover spotted an anomaly, but we don't want to send any Kerbals until we have an idea whether it's safe or not. So first, we are launching this very large single launch but multi-component space station. It will break itself apart when it gets to Minmus and uh, using some automated software it'll dock its pieces together uh, to form what we need to do our science and to make sure that the area is safe before we actually send the Kerbal crew. Also in this episode we are going to be launching the S1 truss, the uh, starboard side radiator assembly that will help cool down the station uh, because we're going to be closing down some of the P6 radiators. And here we go, the burn has begun and we are going directly from the surface straight to Minmus. And the reason I can do that is because I saw Minmus on the horizon. And now we are deploying our wonderful gigantic space station. While the space station deploys, there may be some news about what Joseph has been up to. The space station is still deploying in preparation for its long trip to Minmus. We need to make a slight inclination change in order to get ourselves actually intercepting at Minmus, but that just takes a couple clicks of my precise maneuver node uh, mod right here and maybe pull back a little bit, a little retro, because I can see I'm going a little bit past the orbit, just a couple retro clicks, and there we go. So now we have our intercept. This would probably be a good time to give a little instruction on how I use my Kerbal Alarm Clock mod here. So you can see because I have that node, this node right here is showing up, and I have all these options that I can select for the type of nodes that I want to appear and I basically just go through all of these tabs the specifics and all that where I select that I just want everything to show up and that puts this node and it shows up here and how long it's going to be in minutes and seconds before I actually reach it so when I travel along here and reach that node a little dialogue will pop up telling me at that time uh, that I have reached it so then I can fly out here and there will be another one that will show up uh, once I actually have the intercept. There are all kinds of things you can select. You can do apoapsis and ascending node, close approach. You can do your SOI changes as well as your transfers into other systems. You can select the source of what you want as your uh, sort of what you're both orbiting and where you want to go, where you're coming from, where you're going, that sort of thing. And it's a, just a really handy, useful little mod for making sure that you drop out of warp time in order to uh, get whatever it is that you need to do. So showing you here, I am now traveling toward that node, and when I hit that node, the alarm clock, even though I'm in warp speed, the alarm clock will pop up a dialog, and in a few more seconds, and there it goes, and tell me that I have reached my target. And I just click OK, and the node goes away, and now I'm out of warp time, and I can get here and deploy my Kessler coil. 
So this Kessler coil is going to help me in order to uh, both protect the space station and at the same time analyze the anomaly because the anomalies are generating these strange plasma fields or something. So uh, that'll help protect us and analyze it. We're also going to use robotics to extend some solar panels well beyond our Kessler coils. Kessler, of course, was the famous scientist who uh, first discovered the anomalies on Kerbin and uh, was the re whole reason why this project uh, began in the first place. Okay, so now here we are heading off. All that debris following up behind us will fly way out toward Minmus as well. And then because we were on a suborbital trajectory when we actually left, it's going to go back and deorbit. Meanwhile, we are just going to set up our little intercept to get really, really close to Minmus, as close as we possibly can so that we can conserve as much fuel when we make our retro burn and capture at, on our orbit. And then we will make sure that we are flying over the anomaly and being able to analyze it and send the data back and make sure that it's all safe at Minmus so that we can send our crew that'll dock on the backside of that station there and then begin investigating a little more up close and personal. I believe Jebediah actually is going to go and kind of head up that investigation. So now we have to deploy our communications antenna, which is coming out also on some robotics. And after that, we will decouple the stages that are the extra command center and the science boom that is attached on top of the station right now just so that we could fit everything inside the fairing. So here we go decoupling the command center. That's the bridge of the station. Uh, down below it, it will dock itself up with the main crew quarters and then the science section way in the back behind the Kessler coil will receive the science boom that has a few of the ScanSat mod parts on it and those will transmit the data back to Kerbin for us. So let's see, some other things that are going to happen in this particular episode. We will go out on an EVA and do some station cleanup. We're going to do a crew exchange and deorbit our old crew and send up a couple new guys. We are going to demonstrate what we saw in a previous episode. If you remember when I was building my satellite in orbit, I noticed that I was able to take my probe and while it was still attached to my back, I was able to put a solar panel on it. Well, that got me thinking. I could probably, once I have something on my back, attach just about anything I want. So that'll make it a lot easier to carry gear around on the outside of the station, whether I'm trying to pack it up to deorbit it, or whether I'm trying to bring it out to actually put it into place. So now we're going to deploy our ScanSat antenna here, which will start scanning the anomaly. We have a radio dish pointing down at it. We have another ScanSat science mod part here, and it will also scan the anomaly. And once we have all this data, Jebediah is standing by practically on the launch pad because he is ready to go. And one last thing before we leave the station here, it doesn't have a name. So if you have an idea, post it in the comments and maybe I'll use your name for the station. And now, back on Kerbin, somewhere in the Badlands, Joseph Kerman is transporting some sort of engine. It looks like perhaps some strange experimental engine. What could he possibly be doing with that? Where could he be going with it? Wherever he got it and wherever he's going, he sure is spending a lot of time. It must be pretty important. But now, bum ba ba ba, it is time for the equivalent of the Atlantis STS-112 launch that brings up the S-1 truss to the station and docks in place a gigantic radiator assembly a radiator assembly that is capable of rotating in order to make sure that it stays pointing in the right direction to keep itself away from the sun and allow it to radiate its heat out into space. So we now are deploying our injection stage, letting that booster drop. But I have problem. 
So apparently I forgot to put a probe on that, which means it isn't controllable, even though I thought it was uh, it had a probe on it and it had an antenna. At first I thought I was just out of communication, but no, it just didn't have a probe somehow. And so I can't control it to deorbit it. So we have another gigantic piece of debris. This time, I don't know what we're going to do with that one. I have some guesses what we might do, but uh, Bill, he might need to be reassigned temporarily to some other task because I don't know that we're going to have the resources necessary in order to deorbit that gigantic piece of debris. And now, coming in on the KSS, oh, way too fast. Yeah, apparently I'm pretty good about coming in on my targets uh, really, really fast. Fortunately, so far, I haven't actually collided in such a way that I've done damage to anything. Oh, that would be very, very disappointing if that happened. Now, we are going to get rid of this little, uh, as you will soon see, very jittery little section here. Maybe it's just because it has absolutely nothing going on with it except it being a gigantic uh, gyroscope. And it was so jittery that I accidentally bumped the solar panel there. And off goes a solar panel. And once again, another bit of debris that we'll probably have to try and go collect with Bill's catcher before Bill finds out about it. Unless, of course, we can go and assign him to some other task in Siberia or maybe at Minmus, because whatever, it's the same thing, right? Uh, or actually, I think Bill has been talking about perhaps building his own little spaceship that he can fly around and just collect all the debris himself. But now we are coming in for our docking. This truss has a whole bunch of temporary little RCS engines on it that I'm going to have to go and collect and uh, pack them all up in a box and deorbit later. But until then, it made it very easy, actually, to maneuver that into place, even though it was a little jittery right there at the end. So now we can decouple the injection stage, and this one has a probe on it, so I will be able to deorbit this one. We'll just back it off with our RCS here, something that on the real space station in our dimension, the ISS, that would never happen because they never point their RCS engines actually in the direction of the station. They always do it sort of a way in such a way that it uh, won't leave any of the residue from the engine exhaust uh, to either get on the station or damage the station. Now this one, I was thinking I would deorbit it. It's really jittery uh, and it runs out of fuel way too soon. So another bit of debris. All right, that's three in this episode. Yeah, we're really doing great. Well, anyway, Bob has to come out and start doing his EVA to do the cleanup. He needs to get a gigantic box here, bring it up to that S1 truss, and then he'll be able to take all of the bits off of it that were used to just get it into place and put them in the box so that we can deorbit it later. For right now, we need to empty out the box. So we're taking what's inside it and we're moving it all to the other one and sort of consolidating all that stuff so that this box can come down. And you can see here, that's one of those little RCS jets. So we're just gonna take those off because I was only using those temporarily to make it more controllable, to get it into place. I have some of them on some uh, cubic struts, so I'll have to remove the RCS engines and the cubic struts. Oh, get back here, little box. Apparently, once again, having my issue where anytime you put something on your back, if it collides with the box because the box is right behind you, it will cause the physics to make it uh, eject away from the thing that is colliding with it at a very high rate of speed. So we have to go and grab the box and bring it back down to the station. And it gets really far, really fast sometimes. Uh, fortunately, I can chase them down and they haven't gotten away yet. So we'll come back here and grab some more of this, uh, I guess we'd call it injection orbital debris in the making. <laughs> So in our dimension, this S1 truss that we just docked here, this went up in October of 2002 and very similar to the S0 was about 14 tons 
and translate it into my scaled down 60% scale should be about eight meters by two and a half meters, uh, just like the S0 was supposed to be. Now the other one, if you remember, I made it at nine meters long just because I wanted it to be a little bit more symmetrical in certain ways. Uh, but this one, I was able to make eight meters. So this one is actually fairly accurate. It also has the three radiators on the back that are on a, an arm or uh, like a rotating panel or something and it'll allow it to turn and make sure that it always stays facing away from the sun. I think the real ISS one in our dimension, that one doesn't have the ability to rotate those radiators. They're sort of fixed on that panel and that's why that panel needs to rotate. Now, of course, I'm using the interstellar mod ones and what that means is that they do rotate. So we need to close this one up here. I don't think we need that anymore because with that extended, it's going to be a little hard for me maybe to rotate all three panels on this uh, little rotator pl plate or platform. I don't know what I'll call it. A rotator plate? Sure. Anyway, so we have to get rid of that solar panel there. Pull, tuck that in. That actually happened on the real ISS too. When the radiators on the S1 go into place, the uh, solar panels that are on the Zarya module need to be pulled in because otherwise they would stick out too far. So, in order to reduce our part count, I am going to take off some of these, and I think we have all the science we need anyway. And here's an example now of what I was talking about earlier. You remember I said I had that probe core and I was able to put a solar panel on top of it. Well, I figured that would allow me to stack up these, and sure enough, we're able to take all of these parts and get rid of some extra parts on here to cut down on that. Uh, the rendering so that we can maybe get some frames per second back ever so slightly you know just nickels and dimes right you you keep saving a nickel here and a dime there and eventually you're gonna have some dollars whoops uh they're getting away from me uh-oh i accidentally released the one that was at the beginning of it well in order to get them all back you have to grab them one by one but that's okay not a big deal little time spent but they're all stacked up again, and I can go and get the last ones and go and stick them in the box here, and then uh, we'll be free of five or more parts, six more parts. I can't remember how many I had right here. I think it looks like it was maybe six parts. So yeah, we'll pack all those up, and eventually that progress craft is going to deorbit and say goodbye to all of those little bits and knickknacks. Now, let's demonstrate the rotating of that uh, base for the radiators. Now, because I'm using interstellar mod, I said the radiator actually keeps on turning and trying to stay uh, flat relative to the sun. If this were the real ISS, that wouldn't be happening and I would need to rotate that arm. But I put it in that way anyway. I'm not sure if I can actually turn that off. I have to test out my little uh, mobile base system here as well with that the arm is attached to. And then everything is in working order, so it is time to make a crew transfer. And we are sending up Voss and Helms Kerman. They enjoyed themselves so much last time that they want to go again. So here is our fabulous Hydra crew carrier that has all of these wonderful little shrouds that are so much fun to play with. I can pop off those and make those hidden solar panels deploy. Uh, it's just so much fun playing with those little bits and knickknacks like that. That SDHI mod is really cool. And I like this stage too. It just has such a cool look to it. A little Hydra Dragon slash Orion capsule here with the 6S compartments on the underside to store all of their special gear, which I'm sure generally contains snacks. They're a little too small to contain boosters. They could probably contain science. So how many of the things we got? Snacks, SRBs, science, and struts. Yeah, actually, I think you could probably, if they're little SRBs, uh, then you could probably fit everything in there and we can have a really complete mission. The four S's would be all satisfied. Oh, 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 don't, no. Don't hit it. Oh, geez, don't hit it. Okay. Ah, uh, solar panel. Well, once again, here comes my close approach. Oh, geez. Oh, don't break off. Don't. No, no, no. Oh, okay. 
Ha! Well, okay, so, safe, and uh, now we can go and dock. Yikes, I must really like the close calls. Ah, uh, so, uh, using the crew manifest, we will transfer our crew that was there into the uh, Hydra crew carrier that's going to deorbit, and the new crew will go and take their places in the Destiny and the uh, Zarya module. The Destiny, of course, because that's where the science is taking place. And the, not Zarya, but the Zvezda module, because that's where uh, all of the stations controls. It's sort of like the bridge, essentially. Okay, so it is time to decouple that and send home that crew, because I'm sure by now their bones are turning to jelly. They've been up there for so long. Exercise is very important to them up there because they really need to keep their strength up and their muscles and their bones, but nonetheless, it still isn't good enough. Just like in our dimension on the real ISS, when our astronauts go up, they have to keep doing their exercises because immediately upon getting into orbit for some unknown reason, their bones immediately begin to decalcify. And when that happens, they lose a bone mass. And that is definitely not good to keep that up for a very long time. That's one reason why it's going to be very hard to do things like going to Mars uh, if we don't have some way of keeping up the bone mass of the astronauts that are making that trip. Okay, so now we'll just tuck in our solar panels and decouple that little uh, trunk there, get rid of it, and that way we can deorbit our crew, who will be nice and safe and sound back on Kerbin so that they can go back and visit their families and maybe read a book about Kestla Kerman, the great scientist, since it's now significant for the Minmus mission. Okay, in the next episode, we might learn more about Joseph and we'll send up the P1 truss, send some crew over to the station at uh, Minmus, and maybe do a bunch of other things as well. Until next time, see you later, Kerbinauts.